Welcome to this week's edition of Cardinal Dash. I'm King Jemison alongside Daniel Martinez Crams. And we've got a lot to get to this week, Daniel, because newsflash, less than two weeks until Stanford football. We have been waiting so long. It feels so good to be this close. So with that exciting news, let's get right into it because we're going to talk a lot of football today, Daniel. We know Stanford's season rides on the strong right arm of Davis Mills. In your mind, where does he rank amongst Pac-12 quarterbacks coming into this season? More importantly, where does he need to rank for Stanford to win the five five games you predicted, to win the four to six games in this shortened season? And obviously that would put them among the top contenders in the Pac-12. It's no shock to anyone here that I like Davis Mills. But I think he's a very, very, very good quarterback. That's not going to come as news to anyone who's been following us on Cardinal Dash. But I have him as the fourth best quarterback in the Pac-12 right now, and here's why. Eden Slovis in his freshman year looked phenomenal. He had a great freshman year. Next up, I have Chase Garbers, who in seven games where he played the entire game has not lost last year. That's what we look at in a quarterback. Coaches have win-loss records next to their names, and quarterbacks have win-loss records next to their games. Chase Garbers was 7-0. and And then Jaden Daniels over at Arizona State. Another phenomenal season, only two picks all of last year. And then we have Davis Mills. Does he have the potential to get up into one or two? Absolutely. And if Stanford does go on to have that 5-1 and one season that I predicted, then absolutely he will be ranked there. And I'm going to look stupid for putting him at four now. I'm fine with that. But right now, based on what he's done in the past, even though he does have that pedigree of being such a high recruit out of high school, he hasn't done enough on the field right now for me to put him anywhere higher than four. So that's where I have him heading into the season. Daniel, I'm so excited about this. Finally, I get to be the optimist on the show. I am putting Davis Mills as the second best quarterback in the Pac-12 coming in this season. Now, has he earned that with his play on the field? No, but I think he's going to earn that very quickly this season. And here's my point. Number one, Keaton Slovis is, is set. He is the best quarterback of the Pac-12 coming in this season. I think that if the Pac-12 were playing a similar length season to other schools and major conferences, I think he might become a Heisman contender. He is the best quarterback with the best weapons, and I think USC is going to have a record that reflects that, and, and they will put him in the national conversation. But everybody behind that is very unproven. And the two guys you mentioned ahead of Mills are the only two guys I think you can reasonably put ahead of him at this point. Maybe... Maybe if you're a Dorian Thompson Robinson lover, you could you could throw him in, but that that I think would be a crazy argument. But with Jaden Daniels, it's really all potential. It's really all the Oregon game and a handful of other games where we saw him ball out. And yes, he's very good. I think that if you combine his dual threat ability, that's going to push him uh, around the level of a guy like Davis Mills. But I just love the way Davis Mills throws the football, and that gets to my other point. Chase Garbers wins games, and I'm very impressed with him, and I respect him. I mean, him running in the end zone to win big game was one of the worst moments of my life, but that's the kind of playmaker he is. He's a playmaker. I don't know if he's a great quarterback. Like, can you ever see Chase Garbers on an NFL roster? Absolutely not. I I, I certainly can't. I don't think he is an accurate or strong enough thrower to get to that level. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but I think that he's a great gamer who gives you a chance to win, But Davis Mills is a player who elevates your entire team. Davis Mills is a player who, at his best, has the arm talent to be a first-round NFL draft pick, something I think you can only say about maybe Slovis, maybe Daniels in this conference. And I think one thing that that Davis Mills has at disposal that Garbers and Daniels do not this season is a fantastic wide receiver core, significantly better than what you have at Cal or Arizona State and I think significantly better than everywhere outside of USC in this conference. I think we could see maybe Oregon with all the talent they have in that roster. They step up. But on paper right now, I would say Stanford has the second best quarterback in the conference, the second best wide receiver core in the conference. And I think they're going to accordingly have one of the best offenses in the Pac-12. But uh, I think we're going to get a lot of hate from Cal fans for this one because I know they love their Chase Garbers and Arizona State fans think Jaden Daniels is taken to the playoffs. So uh, maybe controversial, but I'm standing by it. When you look at his stats, and I want to run through them after after I give you a chance to uh, – after I shut up and let you jabber. Uh, if you look at his stats combined with his clear talent, I think we're going to see a breakout season from him this season. Yeah, when we talk to the fans, they like hearing me jabber a lot more than they like hearing you jabber. So I'm, I'm glad you're giving me the chance because – Chase Garbers, in those seven games I talked about, 
265 yards of total offense is what he averaged. Okay, this is a quality quarterback, and I understand that you're going based on potential. That's fine. That's great. Okay, but what we do now, what we do in fact-based world, is we look at what people have already done. And Chase Garbers has already done all these things, right? Davis Mills had a great year last year. Went two and four, right? A lot of things were going wrong around him, and I wouldn't put that record on him entirely. But at the end of the day, two and four next to his name is a starter. Okay. Chase Garbers, on the other hand, did a lot better. And same with Jaden Daniels, right? Eight and four as a freshman, 278 targets of total offense, right? 17 passing touchdowns, three rushing touchdowns. That's an all around great season. And we see Davis Mills sitting around 65.6% completion percentage. I think he has the potential. I do. I really do. And I think what they're going to do in this offseason is pare everything, everything down to make a lot of things more simple. The wide receiver core grew up a year. They're probably, as you said, the second most talented group in the Pac-12. But if we're looking based on potential right now, Davis Mills hasn't done enough. But I, I, I want to hear. What, what are you, you going to tell me? You bring up that Chase Garvers had 265 yards per game of offense um, and, and what was a very successful 2019 season for him. In Davis Mills' six starts, he was averaging 308 yards per game just passing. And yes, he is not a dual threat guy like Garbers, but his production level is significantly higher. And he was doing that with a terrible defense, a defense that ranked 87th nationally in total defense, whereas CAD, one of, if not the best defense in the Pac-12, maybe probably just behind Oregon and maybe a couple others. So Davis Mills, when he was thrust out there, was at a time when Stanford was beat up, when the wide receiving core even was not necessarily as strong as it's going to be this season. And he was still able to put up numbers based on arm talent alone And I think based on time in the system, he's learned it. They don't really have to simplify it for him. We're hoping they open up the offense, but I don't think what they need to do is simplify. Davis Mills has the football IQ to be able to run a complicated offense. Like I said, Chase Garbers, I have the utmost respect for him. But he is a guy who could not survive as a quarterback in the Pac-12 if it weren't for his legs. And he's no Michael Vick uh, on the run, but he's definitely a dynamic dual-threat guy. Davis Mills doesn't have to be a dual threat guy to be good because he's just that talented of a passer. I just want to run through uh, the passing yards numbers from his last five games last season. 245 against OSU, but he did complete 72% of his passes through three touchdowns in that game. 293 against Washington and Stanford's biggest win of the season. He completed 70% in that game. 504 against Wazoo. We know that that was in a losing effort, but he completed two-thirds of his passes too, 66%. And then 290 versus Cal, 74% completions. If not for the two picks in that game, I think we're looking at as a very good big game passing performance. And 276 versus Notre Dame with 61% completions in the rain. That was terrible conditions for throwing the football. If he had not had that 11 touchdown to 5 interception ratio, which I think is fine for a college quarterback, but not really what you're looking for from an elite college quarterback, I think we would look at his stats and say there's a lot of value on this guy as – as potentially the top quarterback in the Pac-12 because he's shown those flashes. So if Stanford, if Davis Mills really is um, the second best quarterback in the Pac-12, or if, as you say, he's the fourth best quarterback for the Pac in the Pac-12, what does that mean for Stanford? What are they capable of doing um, in that scenario? And I think to be the best as we're talking about, and to have that five and one record that I predict, we're going to start to see Davis a little bit more, as a dual threat guy, right? In his high school senior year, had about 400 yards rushing, okay? Somewhere around there. And I've also talked to his high school, his quarterback's coach, who he continues to work with. He says, no one throws a more catchable ball, right? So there's so much to like here. And I see exactly why you want to put him in that top tier. There is that much to like. And if Stanford is going to have that successful season, it's going to have to be both things. He's going to need to up that completion percentage. He's going to have to use his wide receivers because there's a great core there to build around. And then he's also going to have to do a bit more on the ground because I think he has, he's capable of it. And he's capable of doing it smart and in the system where he's not getting himself hurt. But he has to do all three of those things in order to take it to the next level to reach the talents that I think both you and I would say he can reach at being the top guy in the Pac-12. I just think this is a really good year to be a Pac-12 quarterback and to be an emerging Pac-12 quarterback like Davis Mills. Because outside of Keaton Slovis, I think everybody's basically an unknown. Chase Garbers is a known winner. I give him credit for that. Jaden Daniels has a lot of potential in a, in a similar vein to Davis Mills, but I, I just see Mills rising to the to the cream of the crop. And I think that you're right. Garbers is maybe the best um, comparison for Davis Mills in terms of a measuring stick. If 
Davis Mills is better than Chase Garbers this season, throughout the season, I think Stanford will be a better team than Cal. I think it really will come down to quarterback play in that matchup. Um, and I think if if Mills is that good, Stanford should go four and two or five and one, um, which would be even better than what I predicted at three and three. But as we've said over and over again, uh, Davis Mills could be fantastic this season and Stanford could still be a mediocre team. He went two and four in his six starts last season. And as we just described, he played pretty well. That's because we have serious questions about this defense and elsewhere on this roster. Um, and with Paulson Adebo's opt out, there is a severe lack of established playmakers on that side of the ball. Um, we're losing uh, a number of guys that we'll talk about. But we trust Lance Anderson and his defensive consistency. And yet, who's going to be that guy for Stanford on defense this season? Who is Stanford's most important defensive player in 2020? I think there's a lot of guys who are one of the guys. Is there anybody on that side of the ball that can be that guy? Well, I'm going to go to what Lance Anderson is saying for that guy, right? And I think there is a pretty clear that guy if we listen to what they've been saying. And I'm going to look at the guy who's most ready for November 7th at 4.30 p.m. And I think that guy is Thomas Booker, right? In the offseason, Lance Anderson challenged the entire defense to be more physical. He wanted a more physical presence on the defense. And the first guy he named when asked that question, who has lived up to that potential? Thomas Booker. Thomas Booker's had a great offseason, had a great freshman and sophomore year, but has improved even more, was named a captain in his junior year, the only junior captain this season. He's so ready to take it on. He's a physical player. He's going to set the edge. He's going to do all of the things that they need out of the defensive end spot that they, Stanford absolutely needs to get pressure on the quarterback this season. Didn't do that at all last year. Both you and I talked about it. That's where a lot of their struggles started. If Thomas Booker can live up to his potential and even exceed his potential, from what we've come to expect from him, Stanford could actually potentially have a decent year on defense and much better than we may have seen coming in the offseason. I love that answer because I love Thomas Booker, and I, I think he's going to be an all-Pac-12 level lineman this year. And I think he could be and maybe should be Stanford's best defensive lineman since Harrison Phillips in 2017 or have Stanford's best defensive line season since Harrison Phillips in 2017. And yet I think – as important as rushing the passer and defensive line play is going to be, I think Stanford's really been missing something in the middle of their defense. And so for me, the most important player on Stanford's defense this year is Curtis Robinson, a fifth year inside linebacker, a former five-star recruit who, when you look at that kind of talent coming out of high school, it hasn't necessarily equalized with the production he's had in college, but he showed flashes last year where he was second leading tackler. He had, I believe 64 stops on the season. Uh, a few sacks as well, a few passes defended. He forced a couple fumbles. He was all over the field, but I think he has definitely a potential to take a significant next step this year. And I think for Stanford to have a good defense, um, assuming he stays healthy, Curtis Robinson needs to be over 100 tackles and over five sacks on the season um, because I think Stanford's going to need that ball. Well, sorry, I'm doing math on a normal season. So let's say okay. if it's 100 tackles on a normal season, 50 tackles in a six-game season. I got too excited about that. Um, but 50 tackles in a six-game season would represent significant uptick in linebacker production from last season when Stanford, frankly, was, was not getting a whole lot out of that position. We have not had sideline-to-sideline -side athletic linebackers in some time. Yes, Curtis Robinson was on the field, but I think um, Andrew Pritz and others were kind of taking the lead role that middle linebacker spot, I think he's going to grow into that. He can be the proverbial quarterback of the defense. And because of that athleticism, he can make plays all over the field. You almost feel like he can be a bit of a, a safety linebacker combo with his size and speed. And so I see the probably most experienced member of Stanford's defense, along with Malik Antoine and maybe a couple others, as the most important member of Stanford's defense because you really need both that senior leadership in this pandemic year and um, that captain of the defense in the middle who you can trust in a way similar to Bobby Okariki um, was a couple years ago, a guy you could trust to make plays um, against the run, against the pass, and kind of be an anchor for your defense in a way that even a defensive lineman or player in the secondary can't be. And I totally see that. And I'm not going to disagree at all because I think Curtis Robinson is absolutely capable of being that player. But I do want to talk a little bit more about Thomas Booker because I'm so excited about him. I was looking at highlights of him. I saw one that said Thomas Booker cooking. I expected to see him beating a guy off the edge. Nope, it was just Thomas Booker cooking in the kitchen. 
which I thought was hilarious. But this is a guy with a ton of potential, someone who's so fun to talk to. But going back to that physicality that we're seeing, and obviously I'm not going to prorate like you did. I'm not going to give someone 100 tackles in a, in a short season, right? But in last year, he had 50 tackles, four sacks. I wouldn't be surprised if Thomas Booker this season in the short season went and had four sacks again because I think he's that good and he's going to start winning those one-on-one -on -one battles, right? Lance Anderson has been talking about it. They need guys to start winning those one-on-one -on -one battles. They can't rely on blitzes. They can't rely on stunts. They need people to start winning those battles. And if I'm looking to anyone on the defense to be doing that, it's absolutely Thomas Booker. And I think that's where everything is going to start, right? Curtis Robinson is going to play a huge role this season. And I think the return of Ricky Miazon and Jacob Mangan Farrar is going to make that inside back the core that much better. And then Robinson in his second year at the position, he's going to take leaps and bounds. No surprise about that. But Booker now in his third year at the spot, actually has some of the most experience on this defense. As I mentioned, he's going to be a captain this year. That's why I'm looking to him to really set the tone. I'm so excited to see what he's going to be able to do out there on November 7th, because I honestly think he's the one who's most prepared at this moment. Well, and I think that Thomas Booker's personality just fits perfectly into a leadership role. I think that we are going to see him step up not only on the field, but off the field as a leader for the team. And leaders are going to be more necessary than ever this season bring a team together so they continue to buy into what's required because you're asking a lot of athletes this season, not only to put themselves at risk, but to severely restrict their lives um, in the interest of their team. Um, and Thomas Booker strikes me as a guy who would buy right into that and get other guys to buy into it as well. And it's interesting. I think our two answers are answers to Stanford's two biggest defensive problems last season. I mean, Stanford had one of the worst pass defenses in the country. And the issue was that was number one, getting no pressure on the quarterback. And number two, not being athletic enough at linebacker or in the secondary to hang with wide receivers. You have Paulson Adebo, who obviously he's going to hold his own. He had four picks last season, 10 passes defended. But everywhere else at linebacker and secondary was a bit of a liability in coverage. And I think that that is startling. But you do have a lot of young talent, including on the back end, um, that we can talk about some more. But the Curtis Robinson answer to me is also an answer to somebody who can stop tight ends and wide receivers running wild up the middle. The middle of Stanford's defense has been wide open and people have been missing tackles there. And then all of a sudden, what should be a five-yard gain turns into a 15-yard gain and these drives are prolonged and, and the bend don't break philosophy counts on making tackles in space. You, you cannot allow big plays to happen if you're going to play the style of defense Lance Anderson likes to play. But let's talk about some other guys. And since we've talked about the defensive line and linebacker core, Who's the most important guy in the secondary to you? Because that's an area where you really don't have the guy, but you do have a lot of returning experience, even if it might be with young players. There I'm looking to Kendall Williamson. Honestly, a lot of a lot of praise for him in this offseason. They're liking what they're seeing. Obviously, we're not out there watching their practices, but that's who people are really pointing to. So I think if he's making big strides at the safety position, Malik Antoine, obviously a very cerebral guy, but them working together, I think that'll that's the pairing that I'm looking at the most right now, yeah. I think you're exactly right to point to the safety position because I love the combination of Williamson's speed and athleticism and fire, um, and then you combine that with Malik Antoine's experience, and I think he's a very good safety against the pass. So I think you got a guy who I see is in Williamson as being very good against the run, a guy in Antoine who I see as being very good against the pass. And I mean, when you've had the level of experience he's had in the Pac-12, been starting for years now, I think that you can count on him in the back end of the defense. I'm also going to point to Caillou Blue Kelly because he was not expected to get time in his freshman season, but he did. He started the last nine games and I think performed pretty well by and large. Um, had some tough games, but had some very good moments as well, including against Washington. And he's a guy that, um, maybe he can grow into, if not a Debo, then at least a very serviceable Pac-12 corner who you can count on to lock up one side of the field. And I do want to just come back to Curtis Robinson for one more thing. Uh, he won a, a special award in Stanford's football program uh, this past offseason, and that award was for aggressiveness and, and unheralded efforts. And I think that if, if all of Stanford's defense – can live up to aggressiveness and unheralded efforts this season, I think we could see a significant improvement because we know there's talent there. It's just talent that not has not necessarily um, seen the level of production uh, that we need to see. And we, maybe it's coming. And if it, if it does and combine that with a good defense, or sorry, a very good passing offense, could be a special season on the farm. 
But Daniel, the, the defensive regression we've referenced on this show is, is emblematic of a much more troubling trend on the farm. Sanford just had its worst season since 2017 at four and eight, sorry, since 2007 at four and eight. The Cardinal haven't won a conference title since 2015. They haven't won 10 games since 2016. They just lost a big game for the first time in a decade. The trends go on and on and on. So this pandemic shortened season is weird and completely incomparable with other seasons, uh, as evidenced by the fact that I, I really had to give Curtis Robinson 100 tackles. But if he did that, then he must be the flash because it would be impossible any other way. He would be superhuman. But this season, six game and hopefully seven game regular season still feels really important to this program. Um, was last year just a blip? just a four and eight blip on the radar of consistency or is Stanford really at a program crossroads between being an average Pac-12 team and being a top contender in the Pac-12 season after season? Or alternatively, can we not even make statements like that in a seven game season? Is it just too short and too strange to really make these kind of uh, program uh, analyses that, that we like to make on this show? I absolutely think it's too short of a season to make anything, but we're going to do it anyways because that's what we do on the show. But more than that, I think because we've already crossed, I think Stanford had quietly crossed over in 2018 and it wasn't really talked about. And for this, I want to talk about the identity of the team. And this is, doesn't necessarily translate over to success immediately, but what I want to look at is Stanford from 2008 through 2017. There's 10 seasons there. In nine of those seasons, they placed in the top 10 in Stanford program history in rushing yards. The only season that wasn't in the top 10 was 2014 when they finished 13. So they had nine of their best rushing seasons ever in that span of 10 years. That was the identity of the team. And then in 2018, basically a complete re reversal. Bryce Love was hurt. KJ Costello had the fourth most passing yards in program history. The 271 completions he had was 10th. The 424 passing attempts was tied for seventh. And then the same thing in 2019. They were down all the way to 1,266 rushing yards, or two years before that, they were up at 2,800. A massive drop. Completely changed the style of offense, and they had the 11th most passing yards, fourth most completions, and third most passing attempts. So they completely transitioned, and that's why I'm saying they're on the other side of the road. They've crossed the train tracks. They may have looked both ways. I'm not really sure because it just happened and no one really noticed it while it was happening. And yes, in that time, Stanford went from a Pac-12 title appearance then to a 9-4 and four season, which was both above and below expectations, and then to last year, which was a shock at 4-8 and eight that no one really saw coming. So did they cross over? Absolutely. This is not the Stanford team that we had seen in the past under the David Shaw era. Does that mean they're not going to find success? No, not at all. I think Stanford could honestly live with this passing era, but they just need to adjust to it. And so far they haven't yet. So that's where they find themselves right now. So you kind of answered it right at the end, but my immediate follow-up question is, can Stanford be a pass-first offense, a program that really trusts its passing game, win games for it, and still win Pac-12? Yes. Do they have the guys for it right now? I'm not sure. Can you recruit to that? And can you make that your identity? Absolutely, because we've seen so many other teams do it, right? We've seen so many pass-first offenses that are able to get the air raid, the whatever, to win the Pac-12. Are you going to get those athletes at Stanford? I'm not sure. Are they going to get it this year? I don't think so. I think the run-heavy offense plays into the intellectual brutality, plays into the physical style, plays into the shutdown defense of controlling the clock, that is David Shaw's bread and butter. So do I think they know how to ride that much easier to the Pac-12 title because that's what they've done in the past? Absolutely. But can it be done? Sure. Is David Shaw known as a stubborn head coach who said, I've won this way so many times, why should I change? And he's honestly earned that respect. So I don't, I don't know where they go, but I, it can happen. I don't know where it is right now. I think you got to find that perfect medium. you got to have the intellectual brutality mentality with the modern strategy of throwing the ball over the, all over the field, because I think that's how you win in 2020. If you're going to win any other way, then you have to recruit at an absolutely insane level on the offensive line. But the offensive line is an area that um, you can recruit at a average level and be a pretty good passing team. You don't have to have a, a dominant offensive line. And I'm not sure that Stanford can have a dominant offensive line um, 
in, in this modern recruiting era because it's just getting harder and harder and that position is getting valued higher and higher. And, you know, if we see another class where Stanford signs two of the top tackles in the country, like they did in 2017 with Foster Sorrell and Walker Little, that conversation changes. Then you can be a run first team. But the strength of this year's team is quarterback and wide receiver. And you know what they share that in common with? LSU won the last national championship. Alabama, maybe you could argue Clemson, at least from the quarterback perspective. Oklahoma, a bunch of the top contenders in all of college football are wide receiver reliant. And no, Stanford is not anywhere close to those programs. But the point is, wide receiver is maybe the most important position group in college football these days. And I think that's a a bold statement, but Barton Simmons of 24-7 Sports, one of my favorite college football commentators, he's a recruiting guru. He really believes in that, that if you want to look at what separates the top five programs from the top 15, top 20 programs, it's talent in that wide receiver room. And I think you could say the same thing about what separates the top of the Pac-12 from the middle of the Pac-12 is the talent in the wide receiver room. Because do you have guys who can win one-on-one matchups, who can get you out of third, who can break big plays at any moment? And I'm not sure Stanford has that this season, but I suspect that they might. And I think when you combine um, Simi Fajoko, who is obviously a big play threat, have one of the highest yards per catch averages in the country last season, I think should build upon that. When you have Michael Wilson, who's a fantastic possession guy, who I think is a very good route runner, finds a way to get open. Connor Weddington, a good all-purpose guy. John Humphreys, maybe the next great jump ball target. Stanford has a lot of talent in their wide receiver room, and they have to play to that. But what they can't lose is that intellectual brutality mentality that built this program, um, starting with Jim Harbaugh. You still have to get good offensive line play, and you still have to be gritty and tough on defense. And that's what Stanford was missing in 2018. They had the passing attack. They had the offense to do it. They just simply could not keep up defensively. And last year, it all fell apart with injuries. And I'm inclined to say that was a blip. But right now, I think Stanford's closer to an 8-4 and four type team, that being about their average, than they are anywhere close to a 12-2 as 2015. And if I were to say it, I'd say they're closer to a 2019 type season, a 4-8 and eight season, than they are to 2015 as well. The, the low side of the extremes is where Stanford's arrow is pointing. They can definitely bounce that back, but they have to lean in to their strengths, the strengths of this current roster. Um, I, I just do not see this team as one that can play low possession, uh, grounded up kind of football and win games. They're just not good enough defensively for that. Absolutely. And they're going to have to rely on those wide receivers and those wide receivers think they are that good. And I think a lot of it is going to have to be confidence in this season of just saying game one, we're going to be able to do it. But another thing I'm going to look at is the defense, which shouldn't have nearly enough takeaways compared to where they've been at in the past. Stanford is used to winning the turnover battle, winning the possession battle. Stanford's defense did not make those big plays last season. They didn't have those momentum swinging plays. And that's what I think they've really been talking about this offseason. And then we're going to see. We're going to have those sacks from Thomas Booker, right? We're going to start having those plays that start swinging the game. And then now you're really feeling it because that's a lot of that intellectual brutality mentality. That's a lot of saying, we're just going to beat you up front. We don't care what you're running. We're going to beat you and you're going to have to take it. And same thing on offense saying we have these receivers. Let's just go out and chuck it. That's what they're going to have to do this year. Absolutely. It is going to have to be both sides of the ball. I think that's the most important point to drill home is that, yes, we talk a lot about the passing game and that being the the key for Stanford this season, or at least what they're going to rely upon. But you're not going to do any better than four and two. And probably you're going to be more like three and three if you are just a pass heavy team. Then you're Washington State, at least Washington State or Mike Leach and probably Nick Rolovich as well. But if you combine that with a defense that should be saltier this season for the reasons you just described, I think that you could look at a, at a much better season, something where Stanford contends for a Pac-12 title. And Daniel, unless you've got anything else, I think that that's a good place to end because it's optimism. We haven't had enough of this on that show. We think, we think Stanford is capable of something great this season. And so that's all for us in this week's very packed episode of Cardinal Dash. Folks, we got 12 days until we see Stanford take the field in Alton Stadium to try and shock the world. We got a kickoff time, 4.30 Pacific on Saturday, November 7th. We know everybody here will be tuning in. I think it's going to be a great game, and I think Stanford is going to make a statement, win or lose, um, because they should be competitive in that game. And we're going to be back here next week, so go out and follow us at Dash Sports TV on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and please 
subscribe on YouTube so you get the first access to the best Pac-12 coverage there is. And then go out and follow at Sports Pac-12 on Twitter um, for some fantastic coverage as well, including columns from my guy Daniel over here. He's going to give you some of the best Cardinal coverage around. And columns from a number of other student columnists from across the conference. We're the closest to the action, so you want to hear it from us. Um, and thanks to Sports Pac-12 for their support of Dashboards TV. And for Doc, Daniel Martinez-Crams, I'm King Jemison. Thanks for listening, and go Card.